Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Yan, and uh, I've been using Amazon Web Services since about 2009. I guess before I start, I just want to get a quick check of the room, see how many of you guys are using Amazon Web Services or at least familiar with them. Okay, about half the room, that's cool. So um, I've been working with Amazon for a long time now, and I've done the whole journey of you know, configuring virtual machines, load balancers, auto scalers, and so on. And then move on to doing the Docker stuff, containerization, and all of that. And the last 18 months, I've spent a lot of time working very extensively with Amazon Lambda. Um, so in my career so far, I've worked. I've had a pleasure to work for some interesting companies, and right now I'm working for a company called the Space Ape Games uh, in London, where I make mobile games for a living. Unfortunately, I can't really talk to you about what I'm working on because it's all secret. I can't talk about them without NDA. Uh, but so instead, what I'm going to do is to talk to you about some of the things that I did at my previous company, a social networking startup called the Yubble, where we were building something that's a mixture of, uh, you can think of it as a mix of Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And it was there that me and my team, some of them are here at the conference, learned a lot about Amazon Lambda, the service needed the whole new serviceless uh, paradigm and how to operate it responsibly in production. So when I joined Yabo last year, uh, around April time, I inherited a pretty standard monitored backend system that's got just a few things, so on a high level it looks very, very simple. But as you peel away the covers, you find all these hidden complexities and interdependencies that you don't expect to find. And because we are, we, while well, we were a very early stage uh, start social network, so didn't have many people, but we have a few power users. And whenever they will run a campaign on our platform, you get this massive spike in traffic, often 50 times, 100 times the normal traffic we'll be seeing. And with EC2, because uh, scaling is really slow, it takes about 10, 15 minutes to get a new instance running and serving your uh, request behind your load balancer. It means that we have to, A, leave a lot of headroom so that we can handle some of these spikes in traffic, and also, B, scale up a lot earlier than we'd like. To the put, things, uh, put the two things together, it means we're paying a lot of money for CPU cycles that we're not even going to use. And at the time, when I joined the company, we were also taking a very long time to do deployments, typically 15 to 30 minutes. And even worse, it, the deployments take, uh, have to take the whole system down, require downtime, which in this day and age is just clearly not good enough, right? And uh, Dan North, one of my favorite speakers, uh, he also once said that the lead time to someone saying thank you is the only me rep reputational metric that matters. And it's a message that has really s stuck with me and resonated with me. And the thing is that when you want to get a thank you from someone, you have to first provide some value to them. And to do that, we have to ship our software. And until our software is shipped, as far as users are concerned, we haven't done anything at all. So I know that we, I inherited a bunch of architecture that's uh, not ideal, and we want to do something better. But before you can hope to build something that you can consider as good, you need to be able to define what good looks like it's for you. So we came up with a bunch of requirements for around, say, uh, for deployment. We want them to be small, to be fast, no downtime. And we don't want to get into a situation where we have to do lockstep deployment with the client team because of the sheer amount of coordination that's required and effort and stress and so on. I also want the features to be loosely coupled through messaging and that they can be deployed independently. On the operational side of things, we want to cut out a lot of the fat that we have in our AWS bill, and we want to spend less time just babysitting our infrastructure. As far as I'm concerned, the infrastructure should work for us, not the other way around. And we had a lot of technical mess that we need to deal with, and that's a very conscious choice of wording, because for something to be a technical debt, it implies that you, someone would have had taken the design decision for some trade-off with a plan to pay it back later on. And clearly, from what we can see, what we had wasn't that. And whilst we adjust this technical mess, we don't want to take six months out to rewrite everything whilst not delivering anything to our users. In fact, we want to continue to deliver uh, value to our users at a rate that's faster than we've ever done before. So all of this is pushing us to a very different style of architecture. And if you fast forward a few months, we, well, me and my team, we are pretty much transform our whole architecture and arrive at a place, uh, we, uh, at an architecture that's both event-driven and service-oriented, with Amazon Lambda being a centerpiece that glues everything together. At that point, we had about 170 Lambda functions running in production, with many more that were still in development. And we were paying about 5% for Lambda, what we pay 
for EC2 for a comparable amount of compute. But perhaps more importantly, the, the rate at which we are delivering features and changes are now has improved dramatically, going from doing a deployment to production maybe four to six times a month. Uh, in April, when I joined the company, uh, by October, we were easily doing 80, 100, time, uh, 100 deployments to production every month. But starting from the moment that we realized Lambda is a good fit for the direction that we want to go to having that first function running in production, we had to answer a, a bunch of questions so that to make sure that we can actually operate this in, uh, re reliably. How are we going to do continuous delivery? And what about testing, load all these uh, cloud-hosted functions? And then you have the usual monitoring, logging, and so on and so forth. As great as technology as Lambda is, it's still just a tool. And as we change the tools that we build software with, often the practices and patterns that co-evolve with the existing tools, they will have to change. But the, the principles, the things that make those practices good in the first place, those things still very much apply as you change your tools and as you change your practices and patterns to go along with these new tools. Principles such as uh, you know, single responsibility, loose coupling, high cohesion, and least, uh, the principle of uh, least privilege and so on. And as our architecture expanded to have now more and more Lambda functions and more and more services, that many of them interdependent on each other, we had answered a bunch more questions around how we're going to do distributed tracing, and what about configuration management? How do we confi uh, manage configuration across all of these hundreds, maybe even thousands of Lambda functions? And how do we keep them secure as well? So we're going to talk a lot more about how we address these, uh, these challenges ourselves. But for now, I'm going to just spend a few minutes talk about some of the things that we actually managed to implement very quickly. Uh, so when I joined the team, we had a search feature in the app already. At a time, we just one big regex query against MongoDB which as you can imagine, didn't perform very well. Uh, in fact, we were running into performance, we were struggling for performance at even the 100,000 user mark, which in today's market is, means, well, nothing. And it was really hard for us to implement anything that's beyond rudimentary ranking on the research results. Um, so we went about building it from scratch by first making sure that our legacy system is publishing state changes to Kinesis as events so that we can connect those Kinesis streams to a Lambda function who would then see, okay, when a user is created, a new user created event, or a user profile has been updated, you would then update a search index in Amazon's uh, Cloud Search, which is the hosted version of Solar. And on the other side, we can expose that data to allow people to search users by first name, last name, and username, and so on, by putting an API in front of that data using API Gateway and Lambda. And as part of our migration process, instead of waiting for the client team to catch up and start using our new API, we will also rewrite the legacy endpoint so that they will proxy to the new endpoint so that, again, we can deliver value improvements to our users earlier. At the time, we also didn't have an uh, analytics pipeline, so we went about building one from scratch. And the work itself took many iterations, but the first iteration went from uh, the initial discussion to having something running in production in, within just one, what, two days by having a Lambda function connect to all these Kinesis events, and in this case, live stream them to Google BigQuery, which was the BI platform that I have been using for many years. And at the time, our, our BI guy came to us afterwards and said, Jesus, guys, you got, you got it done already. Nothing ever got done this fast at Skype, where who did you just uh, join us from, which obviously is no offense to Skype, but it still goes back to the point that we should optimize towards the lead time to someone being to say thank you for the value that you're delivering to them. As we got more confident about working with Lambda and, the op and the running in production, we started to tackle other more complex parts of our ar architecture. So being a social network, we had a, a sort of timeline feature similar to what you find with Twitter's uh, timeline. The implementation was really poor, it's very overly complicated, uh, badly engineered. In fact, uh, there was a whole spec written about how the feature should work, but none of the tests passed, so the QA team gave up, or the QA team declared the whole feature untestable. And uh, funny enough, before I joined the company, a new CTO had come in, realized the mess that, that, that was in the company, and fired everyone that was involved with the project. Uh, so at this moment in time, we also didn't have the previous team to console on uh, why, you guys, uh, why do you guys do this. So instead, we sat down with the product team to understand what it is that they want this feature to do, 
and then we start building it from scratch again. But this case, uh, we are building on top of the events. Again, it's all about events in the system. We have Lambda functions. So for example, when you post, uh, create a new post, when a Lambda function will run, which, and we find out who your followers are, so that we know where to distribute your post to, and then we batch them into groups of, say, 100 or 1,000, I can't remember now. And for each batch, we send a message to SNS, which will then trigger another Lambda function whose job is then to take your post and add it to your followers' feed, which in this case is stored as a sorted set in Redis. And the reason that we, go, we sort of proxy through uh, SNS is so that we can leverage the retry behavior that you have between SNS and Lambda. The expensive part of this work is to find out who your followers are. For example, some people may have five followers, so it's not a big problem, but also then as your platform grows, people are going to have 10,000 followers, maybe a million followers, so those queries become more and more expensive. And we want to minimize the amount of times we need to retry that particular process, so which is why um, that query happens in one lambda function, batches them, and then sends them off to another function and have the retry happen with between SNS and the Lambda. Again, once we have the data stored in sorted set and in the Redis, then we can expose it as an API using API Gateway and Lambda. And once again, instead of waiting for the client team to catch up, we just proxy the legacy endpoint so that you will now hit the new API instead. And uh, like pretty much every other social network, we had the recommendation feature, you know, who you should follow on a platform. Uh, funny thing is, is, unlike Facebook and Twitter, where they use all these complex algorithms to work out who, is, you know, who are the people that you should be following, our platform just returned the first 30 people from the from database by account creation time. <laughs> you may laugh, but it's great if you're an employee of Yabo, because you always show up in the list. Um, but uh, yeah, I get it. It's not useful for anyone else. So uh, we went about building it from scratch again. In this case, create a cron job, which in this case is just an Amazon CloudWatch event that uh, schedule that triggers, say, every hour or so, runs a Lambda function, and at this point, we have all the systems, uh, all the state changes going into Google BigQuery in real time. So a big, uh, BigQuery is great for running ad hoc queries, even complex ones, and being able to return a result to you within, say, a few seconds, or sometimes tens of seconds. So it means that we can have a cron job, run a Lambda function, run a query against Google BigQuery, find out who are the current trending people on the platform based on uh, how many people have followed them recently with a time decay function, and uh, how many people have uh, liked their posts, retweeted their posts, and so on. And then we take those information back and then save them to DynamoDB, and put an API in front of that DynamoDB data so that we now have an API that someone can call to find the trending people on the platform. At the same time, uh, whenever you follow someone or unfollow someone, those uh, relationship changes are processed as events by a Lambda function to then update a social graph that's stored in the Graphene DB, which is a hosted version of a Neo4j, which allows us to put an API in front of that to give you a very, uh, well, to very easily give you second or third degree uh, recommendations, so people that follow the people that follow you or the people that are followed by the people that you follow and so on. So now we can uh, rewrite the legacy endpoint to instead of returning the first 30 people from the database to show you people that are either trending or are related to you through your uh, social graph. And uh, this part of the equation was done in one night. And then uh, I think it took another day or two to implement the second part of the, of the architecture. So again, very quick turnover of, new, of features and improvements. And with that, let's talk about how some of the things you need to think about when you go from having that experiment with Lambda, having that idea, to actually be able to run it in production responsibly. And the first thing I would say is that uh, don't try to invent your own deployment framework. It's, it's, it's exactly the kind of heavy lifting that we want to move away with technologies like Lambda. So there are a lot of uh, deployment frameworks available already. You should just find one that works best for you and just go with that. 
the one we chose was called a serverless framework. It's been around, it's probably the one of the oldest ones around, and we chose it partly because it's got, uh, there's a commercial company behind it, so they're funded, got full-time people working on a framework, so you can rely on there being constant updates and the bug fixes and so on. And it's JavaScript, right? Uh, it doesn't, it's not just JavaScript. So Lambda itself, so that's a good question, thank you. Uh, Lambda itself supports multiple languages, uh, JavaScript being, the, I think, the, the, the one that most people use, but then there's also Python and uh, .NET Core via C Sharp and uh, JVM as well. But the fact that it runs uh, JVM and .NET Core means you can also use F Sharp, Kotlin, Scala, which I'm doing right now, uh, as well as uh, other languages. You can also use Python's um, uh, support for I said the native binding to nat nat native uh, uh, code so that you can actually use Go or Rust to write a Lambda function. And then there's a plugin for the serverless framework. And that's one of the things that uh, um, the serverless framework does really well. It's a very flexible plugin system so that you can have uh, Python shim that runs your Go Lambda function code. The framework itself is written in, ja in ja um, Node.js, no no but you can use, uh, use you can. Right, yes, okay, sorry. But interesting thing to talk about. <laughs> um, right, and uh, also, being one of the earliest ones, they've had the chance to make some mistakes with the first version, and uh, since then they've had a major version update so that they've managed to fix some, a lot of those problems based on feedback from the community. Since then, Amazon also announced its own thing, um, SAM or serverless application model, and then there's also Apex, um, up, Claudia, Zat, uh, Zapper, Sparta, and so on, that as symptomatic of any new thing that's hyped up, there's just a new framework for you every single week. Uh, I think the important thing is to experiment with a few of them, try to see which one works best for your workflow, for you and your team, and then I would say you, just, you should just try to stick with that framework for the whole company, because otherwise you create this friction as people move around projects, you've got to learn how to deploy, this new project uh, with a new framework, at the same time as trying to learn the new code base and the new domain that they're working with. Um, so I would say it doesn't really matter which one you choose, but try to stick with it so that you optimize for being able to have uh, well, knowledge sharing as well as having knowledge in the team and trying to minimize the friction between projects. And so you start writing your Lambda functions, you need to build a test them as well. And on testing, the best book I've read on testing is this book by uh, Ned Price and Steve Freeman growing object on his software, guided by test, where it talks about different levels of testing, where you have your unit test, where you are testing your code at the object or module level. And if you've got some business logic wrapped up in the, uh, in the module, you can still test them the same way as before. There's nothing different here. And then you've got integration tests where you're testing your code against the code that you can't change. Since the Lambda function ultimately is just a function that Amazon is calling on your behalf with just some code, so there's nothing stopping you from just running that code locally, testing that it's working correctly by invoking a function with a stubbed event and context object like the ones that Amazon will call your function with. The important thing to remember is that the purpose of integration testing is making sure that your code works with code that you don't control. So you should, con you should configure your function's code when you're running this integration test to hit the real downstream system rather than stubs and mocks. And I'll talk more about that later on. And once you've got your code deployed to the live environment, you can run acceptance tests to make sure the whole thing runs end to end the way you expect them to. And as you go up and down this triangle, this you know, level of testing, unit tests give you the fastest feedback loop, which you all love as developers, but acceptance testing gives you the, the, the highest confidence that your code will actually work once it's been deployed. And one of the things, uh, one of my key takeaways from this, uh, uh, from reading this book is that you shouldn't mock types you can't change because, I don't have to read because it's quite long, uh, that we find the tests that mock external libraries often need to be complex to get a code into the right state for the functionality we need to exercise. The mess in this test is telling us that the design is not right, but instead of fixing the problem by improving the code, we have to carry the extra complexity in both the code and the test. And the second risk is that we have to make sure the behavior we stub or mock actually matches what the external library would do. And even if we get it right once, we have to make sure that it stays correct as we upgrade the libraries. And I think in this increasingly service-oriented world that we live in, where we're depending on so many services that we don't control, the same principles and the same risk apply 
to services that you don't control, and therefore you shouldn't try to stop and mock them. And I think this is especially true in the case of, uh, ser well, of service-less technologies like Lambda, and something that uh, Paul Johnson, one of the I guess, store leaders in the serverless community, has talked about recently as well. The problem with uh, testing and focus your testing on what happens inside your Lambda function and stopping out all your external dependencies is that there's a lot of things that can go wrong at runtime that you have no chance of testing. Things with Lambda functions, there's so many configurations that can go wrong. In fact, when I'm working on a, uh, on a feature and the, the first thing that goes wrong when I deploy it is that I forgot to give you permission to talk to the database. And that sort of thing is just not going to be the catch when you're focusing your testing on what happens just inside a function. And with uh, traditional uh, architectures, uh, I guess microservices, when you, you can configure things at a service or application level, and that will cover a whole lot of things that's inside a service or inside the application. But with Lambda, your deployment unit and configuration unit is now at a function level, which means there's a lot more configurations in total, and therefore a lot more things can go wrong in production because of those misconfigurations. And this, of course, becomes a bigger and bigger problem, uh, well, risk, as your application have expands and more and more functions. And one of the observations I made is that most Lambda functions themselves are actually really, really simple and they often have the single purpose of, for existing as well. And the risk of you shifting some broken code has largely shifted, from, uh, uh, shifted to the configurations as well as how your function interacts with the outside world, with the whole Amazon ecosystem. And since the purpose of us writing code, or more precisely the purpose of us uh, sorry, writing tests um, is what am I going to say? The, since the purpose of us writing tests, or more precisely, the purpose of, us, purpose of us writing any code is so that we ship something working at the end of it. So that's the goal that we should be optimized towards, even if we have to sacrifice some of the things that we enjoy as developers, such as a fast feedback loop. And the reason for that, I think that is because as more and more things that can go wrong are now outside of your code, the, 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 the attention and focus you put to testing should also shift along with those risks as well. Uh, at the same time, there's a lot more local debugging tools that's available now. Amazon announced the SAM Local, which allows you to have a simulated environment uh, for your Lambda functions. So you, when you have API Gateway at Lambda, you can actually have it running locally uh, with an endpoint that you can hit, and that can trigger debugging and whatnot. And the serverless framework also supports some de local debugging while locally running your code for Node.js and uh, Python, and if you're using Visual Studio Code, you can hook up your debugger to debug your code locally as well. But I think those tools are great, uh, and you should use them to complement existing end-to-end -end tests rather than to replace them. And the good news is that uh, most of the services they're going to be using for testing are actually really easy to configure for testing. Oh man, everyone's struggling to look at the slides. <laughs> um, so, uh, in my experience, at least, I haven't run into a case where the uh, service I'm using is really hard to test, uh, to use for testing. And on testing things end-to-end -end or acceptance testing, uh, Nan and Price, um, Nan and Steve also say, have this to say that wherever possible, an acceptance test should exercise the system end-to-end -end without calling into its internal code. An end-to-end -end test should interact with the system only from the outside through its interfaces. So in the search API example I talked about earlier, uh, to test this system, we will create a test conditions by interacting with the legacy endpoint to create a new user via its HTTP interface, the same way that a client application would do, and that we will validate that after a reasonable amount of time, the user can then be searched when we talk to the search API uh, with a username, first name, last name, and so on. Another observation we made is that uh, the difference between your integration tests where you're testing your code locally but talking to the same downstream systems to make sure that they're working correctly with downstream. And to testing your system end-to-end, -end, once the code has been deployed and run it inside a Lambda function, the only difference in how these two, kind of, these two type of testing uh, differ is in how your code is invoked. So when you're writing your test cases, uh, we will define our when, um, those, uh, our when steps. And inside those steps, we will have a, we will allow, we will take in a, a toggle uh, from say environment variable, for example, so that we can say, okay, when we want to talk to this API and uh, this is the integration test, then we actually invoke the code locally with a stopped event and so on. 
but we can use the same test case for acceptance testing and testing things end to end by having the toggle point to a, a HTTP endpoint for the function that's been deployed. I uh, put together a small demo that you can use and see how this can be used together. Uh, and uh, I've applied this technique for both Node.js and Scala. Same principle, very easy to use. Um, it doesn't really matter what language or framework that you're using. As for continuous delivery and continuous integration, I think when you, especially as, a, as you're starting a new project, there's a temptation to leave it to the end, uh, but since it's a mechanism to save you time and save you from human error, I think there's a strong argument to do it a lot earlier, preferably at the start, but I understand that the, the temptation to do it later because it's a lot of work typically to set them up, but I think with Lambda, this becomes a lot easier because you get so much out of the, the platform, but also with the tooling, uh, like the serverless framework as well. On testing things end to end, uh, again, same book, love it. Uh, 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 Nana and Steve talked about how we prefer to have the end to end test uh, exercise both the system and the process by which it is built and deployed. So this sounds like a lot of effort because it is, but it has to be done repeatedly anyway during the software's lifetime. And that brings me to something that uh, one of my pet uh, uh, annoyances with uh, these pipelines is that often you've got Jenkins configurations or whatnot that only exist as uh, bespoke scripts on Jenkins and they're not source controlled anywhere. And it's what happened to me so many times that someone makes a change, breaks the whole build pipeline, and you have no idea who did it, why did they do it, and more importantly, what was there, so I can quickly roll back. So for that, uh, as, a, as, a, as a rule that we have in our team, Every project would have a very simple build script that just uh, provides a thin layer on top of what you get with NPM and with the serverless framework already. So using NPM to trigger tests and using serverless framework to do a deployment, and then again using NPM to trigger acceptance testing once the code has been deployed. And all it gives us is a consistent, uh, I guess, DSL. As we go from one project to another, you can always expect there's a very simple build script that you can run both locally and as well as uh, use, uh, using it on the Jenkins. And being a terrible uh, as a writer for bash scripts, so everything is very simple. Uh, all you're doing is taking some commands, run npm install, and then the key thing to remember here is that notice we are not using serverless uh, framework that's installed on the on machine, but one that's installed as part of the project. With uh, serverless framework 1.17, I believe, they allow they added support to remove dev dependencies at, at the package time, which means you can install the serverless framework itself as a dev dependency to the project, so that you essentially tie the project to the version of serverless.yaml file that the project was created with, so that you mitigate the problems with com incompatibility. So if they introduce breaking changes to the format or the, or the, conf the, the config file, it wouldn't impact, impact you and someone, does, someone else doesn't need to install the correct version of a serverless framework to be able to deploy your code. Uh, so that's the main, thing to, the main thing to take away from that. The other thing is that we can use the same script to deploy to different environments, different accounts, uh, different uh, regions, and so on. And this is, it's, well, it's just a script, so you can run it locally, as well as on the CI box. And as for continuous delivery versus continuous deployment, um, the only difference is whether or not production is a manual deployment process or automatic. And we were doing continuous uh, excuse me, delivery where someone commits, we're using Git flow, so by the time something has been uh, PR'd and uh, code reviewed and get merged, then the, that goes into master and it triggers unit testing, integration testing, making sure the code is gonna work and then deploy the code to, uh, to a live dev environment, and then run acceptance testing against that environment end to end. Then the whole thing repeats and it gets promoted to the next environment and the next environment until it gets to production or just before production, we have a manual process. So someone has to decide when they want to do the deployment by clicking a button on Jenkins. And for good reasons, we don't deploy on Fridays <laughs> because we also have uh, drinks on Friday evenings. Uh. So you can imagine that, goes, that can go badly, right? <laughs> Um, and then once your code is in production, now you start looking, start, uh, have to think about how you're going to uh, monitor things and logging and so on. Whenever your function writes to the standard out, it gets captured by the Lambda service and then shipped to CloudWatch logs asynchronously, so it doesn't add any latency to your function's invocation, which is something important to keep in mind. I'll talk more about that later. And you get something, some additional information around timestamp, request IDs, and so on. 
And CloudWatch logs keeps all of your functions and organizes them around uh, uh, the function itself. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with CloudWatch logs, this is you create a log group, and there's a log group for every function, and then each, each entry is what they call a log stream, and the in, in, interestingly, also correlates to a, a particular instance of your function, uh, therefore a container running your code. What I found is that CloudWatch log is not great because uh, it doesn't make your code, well, your logs easily searchable, and that becomes a much bigger problem as you have more and more functions. Of course, it's a common problem people run into in microservices as they try to go from the um, monolithic systems. And the, the, I guess the, the standard approach there is to have a centralized uh, log aggregation service where your logs can be easily searched. And uh, I guess nowadays the de facto standard is to use the ALK stack. In CloudWatch logs, you can actually click on the log group and say, I, can, I want to stream my logs to Amazon's hosted version of Elasticsearch. Uh, or I can have them stream to a Lambda function if I don't want to use the hosted version of Elasticsearch. Perhaps if you've got an LStack set up uh, already, uh, or you, are, you, you want to use um, um, some of the other providers, like Splunk. So you can have a Lambda function do that, but the thing to remember is that every time a new Lambda function is created, a new log group is also created, and you don't want to have a manual process to, for someone to go in there and remember to, all right, new function, so you know, go to the logs, uh, click buttons, um, subscribe. Instead, what you should do is to optimize that. Once you enable CloudTrail, it means that you can now create the CloudWatch event that target API calls that the system is making for you, and in this case, I can create a CloudWatch event pattern against the create log group API call that Lambda will make to CloudWatch logs. And when that happens, call another Lambda function. It's, it's not readable, I guess, for you guys, but it says a subscribe log group. This is another function I've set up that will react to when a log group has been created. And then you will update the log group to subscribe, to, to, to subscribe it to my log shipping function. So every time a log, is, a log group is created, uh, it gets automatically subscribed to this log shipping function. Another thing to keep in mind is that uh, when those log groups are created, they are set to never expire, which has got a long-term uh, sort of cost implication. So you can apply the same trick, enable CloudTrail, create log group event, a Lambda function to just automatically set that uh, retention policy to, I don't know, seven days or whatever works for you. And since I've been running a, a course on, uh, on the Safari books online, I've been doing a lot of these things as demos. So you can actually go to this blog post, which has got code the demo you can actually use uh, out of the box. It's all well and good having all of these logs in one place and easily searchable. But as the architecture gets more complex and things have to talk to one another uh, in order to get something working, you start running into other problems. For example, in, when you create a Block, uh, when you create a new post, it gets distributed to your followers' feeds, and someone opening up their phone and trying to read the fee um, their feed from all the people that they're following. A lot of functions have to work together to make, actually make that feature work. And if something, something happens along the way, and one of your followers didn't get your new post, um, then trying to debug that problem is quite difficult, especially in production, where there's all these logs flying around from individual functions. It's hard to correlate what happens from the logs themselves, which is again a common problem people run into microservices. And the solution there is to use correlation IDs. So things like user IDs, uh, the initial uh, request IDs, and, and post IDs, and so on. But since the correlation ID, since the processing happens across HTTP calls, as well as SNS messages, um, Kinesis events, and so on, it means that your correlation IDs also have to flow through all of those event sources. And the way we approach that is that we wrote our own client libraries for HTTP as well as uh, for Kinesis and SNS and so on by wrapping the the I think we were using SuperAgent, so we create a wrapper around a SuperAgent library, but also the AWS DK library for Kinesis and um, SNS and so on, so that we can then, excuse me, so that we can capture the request, the correlation ID that's coming from the event source. Uh, for HTTP, you can send them through with uh, HTTP headers. With, uh, with SNS, you can include those correlation IDs as the message attributes. But for Kinesis, it becomes a bit harder because there's no way for you to tag a message or an event with additional data. So you have to bundle it in with your payload for the event. 
But nonetheless, you can capture all of those things, and then you can include them in all of your logs from the individual functions, so that I can easily find out from, uh, from Elasticsearch all the things that happened for that one post as it flows through events, HTTP calls, SNS, and so on. Again, I put together a demo that you can try out yourself, and um, the links will be available on the slides once, uh, once the talk is finished. Another problem that people have run into in the microservices world is understanding the performance uh, of, their, of the service, of their, of, of their code, as you need to talk to so many different things. All of them can time out, have a latency spike, and so on. And so Amazon announced that X-Ray, I guess in the microservices world, uh, Zipkin is the most popular choice. But if you're running on Amazon, X-Ray can do a lot of those things for you out of the box. Uh, and it supports Lambda as well, so in this case, you can see my Lambda invocation, how long it took in total, how much time it took uh, to initialize the containers and so on, and the, the, the runtime for my code, how long the function itself actually ran, and inside that, there are different things, uh, how, long, how much time that took. So X-Ray is quite powerful, uh, but it does require you to do custom instrumentation, and from the data, you do get you get a service map as well that tells you at a high level what are the different things that your function is using. Right now, for me, the big uh, missing piece for X-Ray and Lambda is that it doesn't support API Gateway. So when one function talks to another one through HTTP, uh, well, API Gateway, then you lose the information about what happens inside the second function from the, fir from the trace for the first function. But I know that uh, Amazon Web Service is definitely working on that. Uh, you, st you still find out how much time the HTTP call uh, took in the first function, but you just lose the visibility into what happens inside the second function. There's, few, there's a few other caveats I ran into, which I've been do uh, that I've documented, and uh, some of the guys at Amazon has, uh, has saw this, also they've responded to say that, yeah, no, don't worry, we're working on it, so reinvent just in, in a week, week and a half's time, so hopefully that, all of that's gonna be fixed. <laughs> and then uh, there's a uh, monitoring alerting, excuse me, one of the things, uh, that interesting thing that happened is that uh, while we typically we install our monitoring agents on the servers, but since we lose the access to the host, uh, so it means we can't do that anymore. Instead, we are not now much more reliant on the information we get from the platform. So out of the box, you get a bunch of metrics from uh, CloudWatch, including invocation count, error counts, and so on. Uh, a bunch of other providers announced support for Lambda, uh, but ultimately they're still using the same data from CloudWatch, but giving you a better looking dashboards and so on. The guys, uh, IOPipe guys, uh, they do something slightly differently and it's quite interesting, I think. Um, they give you a wrapper library or SDK so that you can wrap your own function code around so that they can intercept invocations uh, when it starts, when it finishes, so that they can send those metrics to their own system and they can uh, they record a bunch, of more, a bunch of other data points around memory usage, CPU, and so on, which is interesting to read about, but probably not necessary for you to understand the, well, uh, the application. Um, but the reason, the thing that I don't like about, well, I don't, uh, what, I, don't like it, I like them, but I don't use them, is because with Lambda and other, I guess, similar technologies, the thing that has changed is that you lose the ability to do processing in the background outside of the critical path where your user is waiting. So where you're sending metrics to IOPI, for example, that has to happen inside your function invocation. An API gateway, for example, doesn't respond to the user's request until your function has finished invoking. And all the while, you've got a user sitting there, click a button, and now they have to wait for your function to send metrics to these third-party systems. For APIs, of course, that's a, that's a bummer. That's something that um, you have to be very really conscious about of where all your uh, additional latencies are coming from. For background processing, maybe that's not so much an issue. But still, the main thing to consider is that everything now has to happen inside the function invocation, and you lose the ability to do background processing apart from the things that the platform does for you. For example, we talked about earlier how Amazon will capture the standard out for you and send them to CloudWatch logs, and that happens in the background asynchronously outside the critical path. So one thing you could do to mitigate some of these additional latencies. So even if you're sending metrics or custom, or custom metrics or, things, or tracking information to uh, CloudWatch yourself, that is still actual latency. So one of the things that I found is that the Datadocs guys do this uh, quite, uh, quite cleverly, is that you can actually write your um, custom metrics as a specially formatted log message so that 
that gets collected and sent to CloudWatch logs asynchronously. And then you can have another function, the one that was to, uh, sending the, uh, the logs to, cloud, uh, to other places. You can have that guy identify those and then send them to CloudWatch logs as CloudWatch's metrics instead. And because you also get additional information about memory usage, the, uh, how long your function took, and how long, your uh, how long you were built for, because Lambda functions are built in 100 millisecond in uh, execution intervals. So if your function runs for 101 milliseconds, you get built for 200 milliseconds. That information is useful for optimization. So you can also process uh, some of those system logs and send them to uh, CloudWatch's metrics as well. And that's something that uh, you can uh, put together a demo that you can follow along and uh, to try to apply to your own system. Um, so for example, if, you're, if you find that one of your functions averages uh, 105 millisecond invocation, so maybe instead of uh, paying for 200 millisecond on average, you can run your function on a slightly higher memory setting, therefore more CPU, and try to bring the average down to under 100 milliseconds, so you end up with a situation where your function is both faster and cheaper. And one of the guys uh, from Cloud Academy, uh, Alex uh, Casaboni, he also wrote a nice post on how you can automate the sort of tuning process for your function to work out what's the best memory setting to use for each function uh, using step functions. I think I've got a link to it somewhere. Uh, if not, come talk to me afterwards. Once you've got your metrics in, the, uh, in you can set up dashboards, set up alarms, and track your application level up, up, uh, metrics and so on. All the usual stuff that we do already. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that using CloudWatch is it's all right. It's, you know, it's pretty cheap. That's the job, and often it's the only thing, the only way for us to get metrics out of the services that Amazon manage for us. But it's got a bunch of limitations around the UI. The UI is you know, it's not great, and also doesn't have some of the more advanced features like anomaly detection and so on. But a big thing for me is that uh, it tends to go down at the same time as the systems that you use it to monitor. Uh, this happened to me quite a few times. I was having an a, having a outage. My service is being impacted. I have no idea how much and how, and how bad it was because I also don't have my metrics. Um, obviously, that's not a really good place to be. And that, for me, is, a, is one single uh, most important reason to use something like IOPipe, where you use an external provider to, as the primary way to monitor your system. But since you're paying for latency for that, so. Me, personally, I keep going back and forth on you know, whether or not I should use the CloudWatch. Uh, but yeah, it's a question that I guess if only you can answer for yourself. And then there's the config management. How are we doing on time? 40 minutes? Yeah, okay. I guess the main thing you want to aim for here is having a mechanism so that you can easily and quickly propagate the config changes across, to, across a large number of functions. Nowadays, when you create Lambda function, you can specify an environment variable. Uh, the UI has been updated, by the way. This is uh, out of date. And you can also have the KMS service encrypt those environment variables for you. But, and that's the approach that we started off with. Uh, and we quickly found that environment variables, they're not so great as you scale up and have more and more Lambda functions, because it's really hard to share configurations via environment variables as they are specified at deployment time and is per at a function level. I also found that environment variables make it hard for us to implement the fine-grained control over uh, sensitive data like API keys and secrets and so on, because, because they're they baked in at deployment time, so the person doing the deployment needs to have access to those secrets. And often in a large company, in the start, it doesn't matter because typically everyone has access to everything anyway, but in a large company, especially in the regulated environment, often you find people need to have a separation between who can access those uh, uh, production secrets. At the same time, you still want people to be able to deploy their code to production, so you need to have that separation between who can deploy and who can access uh, those uh, sensitive data uh, for production. And the approach that people t typically have is having a centralized uh, config service, and this is the approach we went with as well. I looked at console, I looked at SCD, you know, popular choices, the microservice as well, but really didn't fancy them because a, you have to run servers again. You have to manage, configure them, and set up low, uh, no, sort of scaling. And you also have to pay for them when you're not using them. And in this case, uh, for high availability, you have to pay for multiple clusters in multiple regions and so on. And there's also a learning curve involved in terms of how to configure and set up a service, how to run it, how to use a CLI tooling, and so on. 
Uh, at the time, we just wrote our own config API uh, because we know API Gateway, we know Lambda functions really well, we know how to deploy, operate, and operate the Lambda functions. And since then, Amazon has announced the SSM parameter store at the last reInvent, and it gives you all of those things and more out of the box. So nowadays, you should just use the SM SSM parameter store instead. Again, where you have uh, sensitive data like credentials and uh, API keys and so on, is you want to in make sure that they're encrypted both in flight and the rest, and that you have a role-based access to them so you don't have to worry about one of the employees being fired and then he still have all the access, uh, all the secrets on his laptop and so on. Um, so in this case, when one of your admin system admins who's got access to those production secrets can save those secrets into SSM parameter store, which would then be, you can set them up to be uh, encrypted automatically by KMS so that is encrypted at rest, and when your function runs up, you will request the, those uh, configurations from SSM parameter store, which happens over HTTPS, and then it will be encrypted by KMS, which again is a role-based access. So the only time the, those secrets are, exist in plain text is when it runs inside the memory of your Lambda function, as well as, uh, I guess, inside the heads of your system admins. Another thing is uh, to consider is how to make sure you invest effort into having a robust uh, client library that can, uh, uh, that can fetch those configs and cache them at cold start and then uh, be able to invalidate the cache at some interval or using signals. So what I mean by signals is that if you're using this, uh, uh, if you're configuring service endpoints, the location of them uh, as a config so that you have, a, I guess, a lightweight service discovery thing going on there, and you are, you know, you're, okay, you, you, you start your function, the first time it runs, it caches them, it makes an HTTP calls very happily, and to such a point that it sees, oh, the endpoint keep giving me 404, maybe it's been updated. So you can use that as a signal to then go and fetch a new uh, config, config for the location for that service you're talking to. Again, uh, got some demos together, you can try it out yourself. How am I doing on time? Do you know, and then, does anyone know what time this talk is supposed to finish? Five past, okay, so that's four minutes ago. <laughs> okay. All right, in that case, I'm gonna skip the, the last section, um, which is just uh, some miscellaneous uh, pro tips. You can look at the slides, they're pretty self-explanatory, and uh, I guess I'll give you a chance, guys, a chance to uh, ask some questions. And also, everything I've talked about today, I uh, also I pretty much wrote everything as a blog post as well. Uh, spent a lot of time writing recently, so yeah, thank you very much uh, for coming. <laughs>